we're starting a brand new way of teaching at the feast. We're starting something exciting. God is birthing a whole new generation of people who will hunger to follow the word. By book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story. We're gonna sit at the master's feet with total humility and allow the text as divinely inspired to speak to our hearts. Get ready because we're gonna start this journey of longing and really understanding God and His Word for you. Welcome you to Feast at Home. My name is Brother Audie Villaraza and I am the builder of the English session here. Uh, I hope and pray that you are in a good place right now and that you are well rested. I want to welcome especially those who are coming for the first time. Maybe this is your first time to join us. Can I invite you to say our favorite prayer here at the feast as we come in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody stretch your hands and then say this with me. Today I I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I am God's beloved, I am God's servant, and I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody lift one hand towards the screen and let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Today we go back to Matthew as we resume our series called Miracles and More. And if you have been joining us for the last few weeks, here's our title, all right? I want you to type this down as I say it. Make me new. Make me new. That's right. After the Sermon on the Mount, you see Matthew shares with us nine miracle stories. And so far, we have studied about six of them already. Let me show you the chart just so you can, you can visualize it, all right? The first one was the healing of the leper. Second one was the healing of the centurion's servant. Third one was the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, right? Mama B or Mama Bienan for short. The, the fourth one was when Jesus calmed the storm. The fifth was the healing of the two demon-possessed men. And then the sixth was the healing of the paralyzed man, all right? But check this out. In between these miracle stories, Matthew tries to insert what we call two follow me stories, all right? Why? This was important because it was Matthew's way of saying that the purpose of miracles is to follow the miracle worker. You see, Jesus wasn't showing his power just to show off. No, like we said a few weeks ago, miracles were just the way that Jesus introduced himself to the world with the ultimate intention for people to follow him. Matthew wants you and me to know that miracles are good, but we should want the miracle worker. All right? We already read the first follow me story with those two would-be disciples. Today, we're going to read the second one. Okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus calls Matthew, and it says, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, verse 12, he said, Healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. 
And then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. That's right. This is our gospel for today. This is so good. Let me give you our big message. All right? Here's the message. Jesus wants you in his team. That's right. Jesus wants you in his team. Let's pray, everybody. Father in heaven, this is your word. It's alive and it's active. And like always, Lord, we are open wide enough to receive your message, dear Jesus. We want to know a different side of you. We want to see a different face today, Lord, to reveal who you are in a fresh new way. In Jesus' name, amen. <sighs> One more time, everybody, lift your hand in honor of God's word and let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. My prayer for all of us today is that God will speak loud and clear through the message, all right? Hi, it is so good that you've joined us at the feast. Are you ready to be blessed? If the answer is yes, I want you to listen carefully. Our one big message is this. Jesus wants you in his team. Now, the way I'll begin my message is through a parable. Not Jesus' parable, not a parable from the Bible, but my own concoction. It's a my crazy parable. Once upon a time, in one city, there was only one hospital. And this hospital in this city was the best of the best. It, it was like a five-star hotel. <laughs> this, this hospital, this hospital was like a was was this you know fully equipped fully fully high tech modern hospital and uh, but there was a problem the problem was this you know you you might think oh that's great no no the problem was it was owned by rich and famous doctors who only accepted rich and famous friends and if you were not powerful and privileged they will shoo you away but one day there was this great and legendary doctor from another place visits the city and makes a decision I will build a new hospital in this city and it will welcome everyone it may not be as classy as that one <laughs> that 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 five-star hospital no this is gonna be a simple nice hospital but it's gonna welcome everyone especially the poor now he had a problem all the doctors in that city were already working for the first hospital. So what he did was he rec recruited people, ordinary people, to be trained as his doctors. He had his own medical school, etc. So he posts in his Facebook page, Wanted! New doctors! Everybody welcome to apply! And so the applicants were wild. I mean, you've got BPO agents and sales agents, salespeople and taxi drivers applying. You've got some shady characters who applied, you know, like, like petty thieves and scammers and corrupt politicians started applying. And so, you know, they go through their interviews, etc. And he hires people, these ordinary folks and these people who did not have any qualifications. He hired, hired them, hired them. And, and then he brought them to his medical school. The doctors of the first hospital started ridiculing the entire thing, ridiculing this great doctor. And they told him, you know what? Don't build a regular hospital. Build a mental asylum because you need it. There's a loose screw in your brain. You're nuts. You're insane. What are you doing? Look at these people that you're going to be training as doctors. They're, 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 no, they don't have the qualifications. But he didn't mind them. And he kept on training them. And one of the things this great doctor did was in his medical school, he will not only teach medical stuff, he was also going to teach love, how to love. And one day, many years later, many of these applicants, students, etc., became doctors. And they were able to build this beautiful hospital that would welcome everybody, especially the poor. Now, want you to know that this is a totally unrealistic story. No such thing that can happen. But I'm using the lunacy of this story to tell you as an analogy of our Bible story today. Are you ready? Because in ancient Israel, there was only one spiritual hospital. 
the temple of Jerusalem, that if you are spiritually sick and you want to be spiritually well, go to one place and one place only, the temple of Jerusalem, the great holy temple of Jerusalem. Here was the problem. Those who ran it, those who led it, were priests called Sadducees, and they were very wealthy, partly because they had a monopoly. It was, it was through cheating. They had a monopoly on the market stalls where they sold sacrificial animals. Now, this temple in Jerusalem, they, they had sacrifices of animals every day, every day. People would go there, buy, buy animals from the market stalls. The mon mo monopoly, owned by the priests. And the prices were so jacked up, you know, he was, they, they were cheating the poor. Not only that, the Sadducees, these Sadducees, these wealthy priests, they wanted to preserve their wealth. So what they did was they cooperated with the Roman Empire, the, the conquerors cooperated, right? Meaning compromise. <laughs> and so enters the scene this new guy, Jesus. And he announces, I'm going to be building a new kingdom. O open, close parenthesis, uh, based on our analogy, he was going to build a new spiritual hospital. And yes, all the religious professionals were already working for the first, for the first uh, hospital, for the first temple. I'm mixing up my words here. And uh, he started recruiting people into his team, ordinary people. He was not going to recruit preachers and pastors and priests. No, they were all working for the, for the temple already. He was going to recruit fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, John. And the most scandalous recruit was a tax collector by the name of Matthew. Verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. My dear friends, please understand, this is the most controversial, shocking thing you can ever imagine. Like people's jaws dropped. When they saw Jesus go near this scoundrel, this guy, what? Recruiting him to be his disciple. What is happening here? Now, let, let, me, let me say this. Um, maybe, maybe to appreciate how scandalous this was, let me give you a test. May I give you a test? Just answer this question. If you lived in ancient Israel, who would you prefer to be your next door neighbor? A, Pharisee. B, tax collector. <laughs> choose. Before you choose, I'll give you a little background of these two guys. First, the Pharisee. Pharisees were not bad people. They, in fact, may be very nice neighbors. I mean, for crying out loud, they were law-abiding citizens. They were churchgoers. They prayed five times a day. They were Bible teachers. And so you can be sure of it. There would be no, there, they'd be quiet. Maybe accept the worship song that the wife will be listening to while she does her laundry. And no loud parties. No, 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 no. Just the, you know, pleasant, uneventful gatherings of other religious people and other religious friends who will be gathering there in his house. Nice, nice neighbor. The tax collector, there will be more disturbance. I want you to know that the tax collector was considered to be the worst sinner, one of the worst sinners in Israel. Why? Oh, by the way, you know, you go to any country, there is this general, you know, subtle dislike for a tax man, for a tax woman, for, for a tax collector. This is no ordinary dislike, please. No, no, this was hatred. Hatred to the core of their being. They hated tax collectors. Two reasons. Number one, they were perceived to be lying, cheating bastards without a conscience. Now, you might say, how, how, how could that perception come from? Where did that come from? It, 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 you, know, you need to know history, a little bit of historical detail. The Roman Empire, when they conquer a place, they will, hire, they will, they will put first puppet governments and then they will hire tax collectors. The tax collectors, they, they had no salary. What they did was they have an agreed amount of money that they're supposed to turn over to the empire. Any money that they collect above that amount is theirs. 
So you can just imagine the grave abuses that would happen. You know, these tax collectors, they would just, they would just collect and collect and collect. And, and then their houses would be, become bigger and they will get richer and they will, they will wear these fancy clothes, etc. And people will look at them and, and they'll say, my gosh, this guy is making a fortune out of people's misfortune. They, these guys have no consciences. So, so they hated them. Number two, the Jews were intensely nationalistic. And so these tax collectors, they were in cahoots with the enemy. And they were traitors. And so basically they represented the circus government that the Romans have installed there. And so they were the face of this farce government. And, and, and so they hated him. He hated him um, with every bone of their body. Now, I want you to imagine that your neighbor was a tax collector and you, you peek over the ear fence and you see them. There would be Roman soldiers going in and out because, hey, they're, they're, that, that's their protection. And, and so one morning you wake up and there's this commotion. You peek through your window and you see this guy that you know, a fisherman. He sells fish to you. He's begging for his life. He's begging, you know, because he could not pay his taxes and the tax collector with the Roman soldier beside him. You know, you, you, you don't have money to pay. You know, you, you, owe, you, owe, you owe the government, you know, and, and the fisherman says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not. And so the tax collector says, you know, why don't you sell your land? Why didn't you sell your boat? You know, you've got, and, so, and so the fisherman just kneels down and says, please give me more time. Give me more time. And so the tax collector says, okay, okay, but I'm going to give you a stern warning. You better pay by this date or else. You know, you're, and so you see that. And, and, and so that, but that's not, you have to contend also with his loud parties. The tax collector, because he's considered you know, part of the, the, the bad people, he, he hangs out with bad people. So he's got these loud parties with bad with drinking and cursing and the the seedy characters of the underbelly of society would go in to these parties and you see them other tax collectors and you see you see yeah some of these guys you see prostitutes coming in you you see pagans you see idol idol worshipers go in into these parties so my dear friends i'm going to ask you this question again who do you want to be your next door neighbor a pharisee B, tax collector. And I will not blame you. Most of you will probably say, <laughs> you know what, to be more practical, I'm going to get the Pharisee as my next door neighbor. Jesus, he picked B, tax collector, not only as his neighbor. He recruited him to his core team. My dear friends, I, I need to preach to you today. And uh, before I pass on the baton to to. Uh, the second part of this preaching, which is the juicier part, um, I, I need to pause for a while and, and, and tell you that Jesus is still recruiting his team. He's still building this spiritual hospital that will reach out to, to those that feel the broken and the wounded and the poor and, and, and the sinners. He, he's still forming this core team and he wants you to be in his team. Jesus is saying, come follow me. And I know most of our response is me, me to be part of your team. Jesus, uh, yeah, no, I'm not deserving Jesus. You know, if you know me and you know, you know what, I, what, what, not me, Jesus. I was 12 years old when Jesus recruited me to his team. And if you knew me to, when I was 12 years old, you would say, why would Jesus pick this guy? My grades were awful. When I was in grade two, I started failing in school. I had 72 in math. That was my grade in math. My mom panicked that she got a math tutor. I like telling the story. She got a math tutor. By the end of the school year, from 72, my grade went to 75. Woohoo! My mom was so happy. Not because I learned anything in math, but because the tutor that my mom hired was also my math teacher. So, never mind. <laughs> I had bad grades. My classmates, some of them had bad grades too, but they were so good in sports. They were good in basketball and baseball and soccer. I was, I was bad in sports. I was so bad. And so there, I was not good in class. I was not good in sports. And then I was... I had no money. My mom would give me 50 centavos a day. And I could, I could only buy biscuits for, in the cafeteria. My classmates had five pesos a day. And, they, and so I felt so 
so bad. I felt, I, fe I said to myself, you know, I, I was bad in my grades. I was bad in sports. I, was, I had no money. And then I was ugly. I was ugly. Emphasis on past tense, of course. <laughs> uh, my classmates called me tip for tipaklong and ref. Not, not, not for referee, for refugee. I, I, I look so scrawny and thin. And, and, but you see, when I was 12 years old, when people around me did not see anything good in me, and when I did not see anything good in me, Jesus passed by. And Jesus saw wonderful things in me that I never saw in myself. And he recruited me. And he said, follow me, Bo. Join my team. Let's change the world. And that's, that's what I did. I said, yes. And Jesus is recruiting you. Jesus wants you in his team. Will you say yes? I hope so. I really hope so. Let's read on. In verse 10, it says this, Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. I don't know about you, but you know what? I find this a little bit funny. Because again, remember that Matthew was the one writing this down. This is his gospel. So you would think that Matthew would, you know, he would write a better description for himself, right? I mean, imagine if you had to write your own autobiography. Would you use uh, to describe yourself with the words, you know, like evil, stubborn, selfish, crooked, sadistic? No, right? You wouldn't describe yourself to be like that. No, you would use beautiful words that would put your name up on a pedestal. But you know what? Matthew didn't do any of that. Instead, he blatantly just says that Jesus ate with tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. He was calling himself a sinner. But you know what? This is how brilliant Matthew is. I believe that he did this on purpose and you'll find out later why. All right. So how did the Pharisees respond to this? It says here in verse 11, But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? Let me ask you this question, and I want you to be honest in answering, all right? Were you ever accused of hanging out with the wrong crowd? I mean, in the past, come on, give me a hands up if you can relate to that. Were you ever accused of being in the wrong crowd, hanging out with the wrong people? Or maybe even worse, let me flip that question, all right? Were you ever accused of being the wrong crowd by somebody else? I, I think that that is the worst thing that you can ever hear from someone. You know, when someone tells you, B-I-K, you know, bad influence. I don't blame people. I don't blame you, especially parents, you know. Parents who are always worried about their children, whether their children is hanging out with the wrong crowd. Because, of course, as much as possible, we want to protect our children from the wrong influence. But you know what? What Jesus is simply saying here is that we shouldn't stay away from people just because the world defines them to be different. I mean, how else are we going to reach people who are far from Jesus if we stay away from them? I believe that the best way to evangelize people is to meet them in the middle of their mess. That's right. But don't get me wrong, all right? I want to qualify this for a moment because you might end up thinking that, you know, I shouldn't stay away from any wrong person. No, here's what you need to do. When your foundation isn't that strong yet, I think it's good advice, yes, to stay away from bad influences. Like, for example, if you've got a drinking problem, don't go into bars and into clubs thinking that you are going to influence them to stop drinking. You know, that might be a losing battle. Instead of healing the disease, you know what's going to happen? You wind up to be the one infected. <laughs> but what you need to do first is this. You need to get your soul, yourself strong first. All right, build a strong foundation, build your immunity, grow some roots. And then as you become morally stronger and as your roots grow deeper, then you can go out into the peripheries and then influence and impact people in a positive way. All right, let me put it this way. Your job is to not let people pull you down into their dysfunction. No, your job is to push them up into your positive disposition. Can I get an amen from somebody? This is what Jesus meant when he said in verse 12, and I quote, Jesus says, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. This principle completely shattered 
what the, what the Pharisees believed in all their life. All right, let me explain. The Pharisees were like people who saw themselves to be like, you know, they would see themselves as doctors who could heal the sick. But here's the problem. They didn't want to come into contact with sick people. <laughs> But if you're a doctor, where else do you go to heal people? You know, not in a coffee shop, of course, not in the mall, right? Obviously, you go to the hospital because that's where the sick people are. Once upon a time, someone said this, that the church is not a museum of saints, but rather the church is a hospital for sinners. That's powerful. Pope Francis says the same thing, but in a different way. He says that the church is a field hospital after the battle. You know, after the battle is done, if we want to be the kind of church that truly seeks the lost, then we need to do this. We need to socialize with the sick. We need to go out into the battlefield and start rescuing the injured, start rescuing the broken and the rejected with love as our main weapon. That's precisely what I experienced at the feast. You know, when I walked into this community more than a decade ago, I was broken in three ways. My heart was broken. My relationships were, were, were broken. And guess what? My wallet was also broken. <laughs> many of you would probably be able to relate to this. I mean, come on, tell me. How many of you walked into this community as a broken person? Come on. With broken marriages, broken bodies, broken spirits, broken hearts. Come on, anybody. But what happened over time? People loved you. People accepted you. People embraced you. People journeyed with you. The sad fact, my dear friends, is that there are still a lot of churches all over the world and prayer groups and even religious organizations that are big on purity, but they're very, very small when it comes to mercy. You know, these groups might look like field hospitals on the outside, but on the inside, they feel more like a military camp. A military camp where the main message that's preached is that if you've got what it takes, well then come and apply. You know, come and be part of us. If you are strong enough, disciplined enough, good enough, well, you just might be accepted. That's what other churches preach. When Jesus instituted his church, you know what? It was built on mercy. It was founded on love. It was built on the words that Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If we cannot dispense and give mercy just like what Jesus did, you know, sadly, we cannot call ourselves the church because our task is to embrace sinners. It's not to exclude them. That's why we're called the feast, right? Our main template is based on Matthew's party. I mean, this is the place where we celebrate God's mercy. This is the place where even the worst sinners are welcome. This is the place that's not only reserved for holy people, but people who have many holes in their life. Come on, are you struggling right now? Do you feel like garbage sometimes? Do you struggle with things like temptation, purity, anger, insecurity, addiction? Well, hey... Come on in. This is your place. You are invited to this banquet. I mean, you are in good company here. None of us are perfect here, all right? I don't say this to brag about our sins. No, but on the contrary, I say this to declare the immutable truth that no one is perfect. Only God is perfect, all right? We all have weaknesses, but you know what? That's okay. Because St. Paul says this, I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Hallelujah. I love that. The next thing that Jesus says here, let's read in verse 13. He says, then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Why did Jesus say this? I believe that Jesus was making it clear that he wasn't doing anything new. I mean, this was not a new thing. In fact, even the, the, the Pharisees and the psalmists, they all knew this. Because hundreds of years ago, you know, the prophet Hosea, he said the same thing. 
Hosea says this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, during the time of Hosea, God's people were very good at giving sacrifices, but they were very bad in giving mercy. And so Jesus was citing this old wisdom, this old knowledge, to simply preach the message that God, since the beginning, He wants mercy displayed, not sacrifice. That God would rather see mercy served than sacrifice. So in a way, Jesus was asking, and I believe that He's asking all of us today, so what if you pray every day? So what if you go to church every week? So what if you fulfill all your religious obligations? What use is all of that if you don't show mercy to the broken and wounded and sinful? What use is that if you don't know how to be merciful to people? All right, I want you to think about that. Let that resonate with you. Anyway, we're going to move to the next story. Found in verse 14, I want you to know that this might be a different narrative, but it's still very much connected to the first story. And I'll, t- I'll tell you why later. It says here, one day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we do and the Pharisees do? And then Jesus replies in verse 15, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. All right. Number one, we all know that Jesus fasted, right? I mean, 40 days to be precise in that desert. And we also know that some of the disciples, they also fasted because Jesus, he taught about this in the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, four chapters ago. But why were they not fasting now? That's the question. Jesus wanted to be very clear. And here's the message, okay? When you find sheep that was lost in the flock, you know, missing sheep, and then you find them, you don't mourn right? You're not sad. No. Instead, you celebrate, right? You throw a party. You rejoice. Why is this important? Because the kingdom of God will always be marked by a celebration. I mean, remember the parable that Jesus said? Jesus was throwing a party for the sinners, just like the story of when the father threw a banquet in honor of his prodigal son, right? I need to preach this to you. I want you to know this, that when someone comes back to the Lord after being away from Him, heaven rejoices. Heaven celebrates for their return. In fact, I believe this, that when you came back to God, when you were lost after some time, heaven celebrated for what was once lost has now been found. Hallelujah. This should be our attitude as a church, you know, to be inclusive and not to be exclusive. To embrace and not to exclude because I believe that the church that has no room for celebration will not have room for prodigal sons. And I don't know about you, but I believe that I am a prodigal son. And I want the church of Jesus to be accepting to people like me. You see, the day that we start turning people away just because they're different, just because we consider them to be dirty, to be sinners, that's the same day that we no longer become a church. Instead, we become a club. You know, a club exclusively for members only. And clearly, this is not how Jesus wants His church to be. That's right. Jesus explains it even further. Let me read it to you in verse 16. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And then verse 17. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old skins would just burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. No, new wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. Let me explain this, all right? Jesus was using this analogy of old wineskins to simply explain that Jesus did not just come to repair or reform the old institutions of Judaism. That's what the Pharisees thought. Instead, Jesus came to institute a new covenant. We talked about this many months ago, that this is the same covenant that Isaiah prophesied about, you know, a new covenant that doesn't abolish the old, but instead accomplishes it and ultimately improves on it, okay? What was this new covenant like? Let me explain. It used to be that Judaism taught their believers to exclude people, all right? To exclude people. You you do not belong here. You know, remove the bad seeds, cast out the sinners, kick out the losers. That was the old wineskin, the old belief. It was the old way of doing things. And Jesus was simply saying, you know, you cannot fix this. 
You can't patch this up. You can't sew this together. You are better, better off throwing it away and then getting a new one. Because if you store new wine in this old wine skin, you know what'll happen? You will simply waste the good wine when the old wine skin breaks. Instead, what you need to do is you need to replace the old wine skin completely. That way, he says this in verse 16, and I'll read it again. He says, new wine is stored in new wine skins so that both are preserved. Let me preach this to you. All right. Again, Jesus uses the analogy of old and new wineskin to explain that this old belief that God is exclusive only for those who are righteous, this no longer belongs in the new church that Jesus was building. You see, the new church that Jesus was establishing was not an exclusive church. It was inclusive. You know, Jews and Gentiles were welcome. Saints and sinners were welcome. Men and women were welcome. In fact, the book of Ephesians, it, it proves this. It simply says in chapter 2, verse 16, Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. Let me ask you this. Are you still using old wine skins? Are you still using old wine skins? What do I mean by that? Do you still find yourself excluding other people out simply because of their differences? Because they don't talk like you, they don't behave like you, they don't come from the same background as you do, they don't have the same last name as you do? You know what? That might be old wine skin. What you need to do is you need to toss that out. You need to throw that out. You cannot store new wine or else it'll just break out in that old wine skin. What is the new wine that we're talking about? Or better yet, who is the new wine? Here it is. Jesus is the new wine. And mercy is the new wine skin. Mercy is the new normal, my dear friends. You don't need a PhD to understand this. You don't need to have a master's of theology to grasp this. You don't need special skills. You only need a heart. Do you have a heart? Come on, if you've got a heart, give me a heart emoji if you do. Come on. That means that if you've got a heart, it makes you qualified to give mercy. Okay, let me explain by showing you this photo. I shared this story with you a few Sundays ago. When the lockdown happened, you know, many jeepney drivers, they lost their jobs. They lost their only means of earning. In fact, even up till today, we see how many of them have resorted to just begging in the streets, right? Under the leadership of Brother Butch Jagueta, he's the head of our men's LG, Brother Darwin Susano, who is a local resident of Makati, you know, he witnessed how a few of these jeepney drivers were stranded in an open parking lot right beside his condo building. And you know what? He, did, he didn't hesitate. He never hesitated, not for one moment. Armed with just the little resources that he, that he had and a very big heart, he started cooking food for them. And every single day, he fed them. And eventually, you know, one day, he shared Jesus to them. He started showing our feasts to them. And you know what? Little by little, they got to know who Jesus was. They could not go to church. So instead, Darwin brought church to them. He made them feel and experience church. Let me end with this very simple thought, my dear friends. When Jesus called Matthew that day, Matthew left his tax collector's booth just like that. You know, leaves everything behind, leaves his table, leaves everything, all except for one thing. Would you like to know what Matthew took with him in this journey? I'll show you. Matthew left everything behind, all except for his pen. That's right. The very same pen that Bible scholars say that Matthew most likely used to write and document the first gospel that we are still reading and studying today. Let me ask you this question. What is it that you have that Jesus can use? What is it that you have right now that Jesus can use? It doesn't need to be an extraordinary gift, you know. It can be something as simple as a pen. Something as ordinary as mercy. You don't need to be a saint, my dear friends. You can be a sinner like Matthew. 
That's what I love about Matthew. In fact, when I think about Matthew being this great sinner, unlike Peter and the other disciples, no, Matthew was a tax collector. He was abhorred by many people. People rejected him. People didn't want to be seen with him. But you know what? Jesus, instead of rejecting him, Jesus accepted him. And Jesus choosing Matthew only tells me one thing. It was a big, powerful message that says that if a great sinner like Matthew can be converted, how much more me? How much more you? I have said this time and time again, and let me say it again. God's mercy is bigger than your mess. His compassion is bigger than all your crimes. You see, my dear friends, Jesus wants you to be in His team. Jesus wants you in His team. Offer what you have to Him because He is the new wine. He wants to pour Himself out to you. He wants you to be His new wineskin, His new church that is clothed in mercy. He wants you to be a vessel of peace, a vessel of understanding, a vessel of love. Can I get a, a powerful amen? Amen, somebody. Let's pray. Let's pray, everybody. Let's bow down in the presence of our good, great, gracious God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you so much for your words. Thank you for your wisdom that has been pouring out since, since we started this session. Father, in a very deliberate way, we ask you to teach us how to open our life to you so that you can use everything that we have. Make us, Lord, your instrument in this world. Make me an instrument of your peace. Make me an instrument of hope. Make me a, a tool of encouragement to those around me who desperately need you who desperately need the faith to believe, Lord, that you have a purpose in this world. You are the new wine, Jesus, and we want to be your wineskin. So pour out yourself in our life. We want to be able to store you in our hearts, Jesus, so that we can flow out into this world. Amen. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and tell people and all your friends and family about the inspiration they can receive here. And remember to subscribe and click the bell icon so that you get notified when we're going to upload the next inspiring video.